The year 79 AD brought tragedy upon the Roman world when a volcanic eruption destroyed cities and settlements in central Italy, the most famous of which today is Pompeii. Pompeii was buried underneath deposits of pumice lapilli and ash, and remained so for over 1,500 years, when the site was rediscovered in the 1700s. At Pompeii, archaeologists have uncovered a wealth of artifacts, buildings and houses preserving beautiful frescoes, statues, and mosaics, and even remains of humans who, unfortunately, were victims of the worst volcanic eruption recorded in European history. Now, archaeogeneticists are discovering who the Pompeians were through ancient DNA, and you won't be expecting some of the results. I'm Adam Archaeologist, your go-to informant on everything archaeology, and in this episode, I'll dive into who the Pompeians were at the genetic level, explore what else ancient DNA can tell us about the victims, and tell you which interpretation I strongly disagree with, and my reasons why. Pompeii is a moment somewhat frozen in time. The deposits covering the victims degraded the soft tissues of the bodies, but they left skeletons and voids that preserved their forms. A 19th century archaeologist named Giuseppe Fiorelli had the brilliant idea of filling in those cavities with plaster, and these are what you'll see today if you visit Pompeii. But what some may not know is that embedded within those casts are bones. We also have regular skeletons from the site, and the samples that have been studied come from both bones with plaster casts and skeletons. And this may sound odd, but Pompeii's unique burial environment actually helped preserve good amounts of DNA here and there. On the one hand, one might reasonably expect the high temperatures to have damaged the DNA inside the bones. But on the other hand, the pyroclastic materials may have limited exposure to oxygen. Oxygen promotes the activity of DNA-degrading enzymes. So, some of the bones have preserved a remarkable amount of endogenous DNA, sometimes yielding more than 90%. Now, this hasn't been the case for most Pompeians, the level of preservation varies greatly, but still, getting 90% endogenous DNA out of an ancient sample is a dream for archaeogeneticists, given that the yield is often less than 1%. We currently have two journal articles and a doctoral thesis that have published information on nuclear genomes from Pompeii. By nuclear, I mean considering all of someone's DNA that's in the cell's nucleus, not just markers that tell us about deep direct maternal and paternal ancestry. The first paper focused on two victims found within a house known as the Casa del Fabro, which translates to House of the Craftsmen. The victims were a man aged between 35 and 40 years old and a woman aged over 50. Scientists got the nuclear genome of the man, but only the partial genome of the woman, so we really only have the results of DNA analysis performed on just one person here. The second paper focused on five genomes coming from victims found in the House of the Cryptoporticus, the Villa of Mysteries, and the House of the Golden Bracelet. The thesis analyzed samples from different parks of the Pompeii Archaeological Park. So, who were the Pompeians? The man from the Casa del Fabro was genetically similar to other Central Romans of the Roman Imperial Age that have had their genomes tested as well. If we look at this PCA plot, we see that he clusters with them, represented by those dark green circles. For those of you who are unfamiliar with PCA, which stands for Principal Component Analysis, it's a very useful tool in genetic population studies, not only because it visually shows us where a sample or population fits in relation to other populations, both ancient and modern, but it also doesn't make any assumptions about a sample's genetic ancestry, and it doesn't force it to cluster with a population. It plugs everything onto the plot, and we can then see which population or populations it clusters with or maybe it doesn't cluster with any of them at all. So, here we can see that the Pompeian is genetically similar to Imperial Romans from Rome and its environ. But that leads us to an important question. What does it mean, genetically, to be an Imperial Roman from Central Italy? All populations, including the Central Romans, resulted from admixture between different populations over time. We can test different admixture models comprising different sets of ancient populations and see which one fits a particular sample. By testing models here, I mean testing different combinations of ancestral groups to see which combinations fit. For example, if your mom is English and your father is half Japanese, half Finnish, you would expect a three-way model where you derive your ancestry from these three populations to be a good fit. So, using a statistical tool called QPRM, the researchers found that the genetic ancestry of the Casa del Fabro individual could be modeled as 51.6 plus or minus 7.89% Neolithic Anatolia, 
30.5 plus or minus 8.1% Neolithic Iran, 13.5 plus or minus 8% steppe related ancestry, and 4.4 plus or minus 5.4% Western hunter gatherer. This follows the trend seen in ancient Europe because there was a mass migration of Anatolian farmers into Europe. They're the ones who spread agriculture there. And then later herders migrated from the Eurasian steppe. We use the term Western hunter gatherer to refer to the hunter gatherers that lived in Western and Central Europe. They predate the advent of farming in Europe. However, the Casa del Fabro man was a bit different from imperial Romans from Rome and its environ in one regard. He didn't feature the increase in Iranian related ancestry seen around the capital. To quote the paper, the presence of Iranian related ancestry has been identified in Italy since the Neolithic period, with a reported increase in this component in central Italy during the Roman Imperial Age compared to the previous Iron Age period. However, when performing the same four population test, but using the Pompeian individual instead of Imperial Age Romans from Rome, the result is statistically non-significant, indicating that in Individual A of Pompeii, no further contribution by Iranian-related ancestry occurred after the Iron Age." End quote. I will do an episode on the genetic history of Rome and its environ. Stay tuned. The second study got sufficient nuclear DNA data for 5 out of 14 individuals they wanted to test. One comes from the House of the Cryptoporticus another from the Villa of Mysteries, and three from the House of the Golden Bracelet, one of which was a child. Here you can see where they fall on a PCA plot. They cluster with current Eastern Mediterranean, Levantine, and North African Jewish populations, and are placed away from present-day Italians. Present-day populations are represented by gray circles, and the colored circles represent ancient populations from three regions. When looking at ancient populations, Pompeian individuals are quite scattered, but generally cluster closer to Levantines. Admixture analysis, which assigns ancestry compositions, found a large Anatolian Neolithic component and another component corresponding to Caucasus hunter-gatherer or Iranian Neolithic ancestry, with some input from European hunter-gatherers and sub-Saharan Africans. However, admixture has its pitfalls and sometimes results can arise from background noise, meaning a person may not actually have ancestry from a region that admixture has given. So the researchers tested different admixture models based on ancient populations using QPAD for each of the five individuals. In general, the largest proportion of the ancestry of these five Pompeians was derived from populations related to Anatolian Neolithic farmers and Levantine pre-pottery Neolithic farmers with a decent amount from Neolithic Iranian farmers. However, there were important differences. The man from the House of the Cryptoporticus and one of the adults from the House of the Golden Bracelet fitted a model where their ancestries comprised 62-69% to Anatolian Neolithic farmers and 31-38% to Iranian Neolithic farmers. The man from the Villa of Mysteries fitted a model of 65.3 plus or minus 4.5% Levantine pre-pottery Neolithic farmer related and 34.7 plus or minus 4.5% steppe related ancestry. As for the other two individuals in the House of the Golden Bracelet, the remaining adults fitted a model of having had 57.7 plus or minus 3.1% Levantine pre-pottery Neolithic related ancestry and 42.3 plus or minus 3.1% Neolithic Iranian farmer related ancestry. Meanwhile, the child fitted two models, each comprising three ancestral components. In both models, he could be seen as deriving 84-97% to and 69-88% to of his ancestry from Anatolian Neolithic farmers and Iranian Neolithic farmers, respectively. However, in one model, the third ancestral component was 21.2% plus or minus 7.1% Levantine pre-pottery Neolithic farmer derived, and in the other model, the third component was 9.8% plus or minus 2.8% Chalcolithic North African. These insights are very interesting because they tell us that the population of Pompeii at the time of the eruption was genetically diverse. In other words, the Pompeians did not make up a genetically homogeneous population. Their genetics tie them with the Romans of central Italy, as well as to the greater Mediterranean world, particularly the eastern Mediterranean and, to a certain degree, North Africa. Genetic diversity was also seen in samples presented in the doctoral thesis, and these samples came from different parts of the archaeological site. You can see how they plot here on the PCA. The Pompeians, represented by orange diamonds, don't cluster tightly together, they are actually quite dispersed. 
This diversity makes sense, as the Italian peninsula had become a crossroads and the center of an expansive trade network by the time we hit the imperial period, that is, when we see the Roman Empire form and flourish. Also, starting in the 8th century BC, the Greeks had settled in southern Italy and had established colonies there. This area is called Magna Graecia. Some of the eastern Mediterranean DNA seen in the Pompeians could have come from these early settlers. But we also know that Eastern Mediterranean ancestry increased in Rome and its environ during the imperial period, so much of the Eastern Mediterranean DNA seen in the Pompeian individuals would have been more recent. Overall, the genetics of the Pompeians reflect Pompeii's status as a crossroads. This is really interesting. I remember reading about Pompeii as a child and being mesmerized by the archaeological site. Now, we've been able to do DNA tests on them and understand more about their ancestral origins. And the insights we are gaining are super fascinating. Ancient DNA really is a treasure. Now, we also have the haplogroups of these Pompeians. Since haplogroups trace direct maternal and, for males, direct paternal ancestry, they can tell us something about someone's very ancient direct maternal and paternal ancestors. Your mitochondrial haplogroup traces your direct maternal line, and in males, the Y chromosomal haplogroup traces the direct paternal line. Everyone who shares a haplogroup shares a common direct maternal or paternal ancestor. The man in the Casa del Fabro belonged to mitochondrial haplogroup HV0A, a subclad of the haplogroup HV. HV is an ancient haplogroup and is also ancestral to the more common haplogroup H, whose subclads are widespread in Europe today and found in adjacent regions to varying frequencies as well. It is also ancestral to the V lineage, which some people associate with HV0. According to the paper, this is the first time HV0A has been found in a sample from Imperial Romans in Italy. Meanwhile, his Y chromosomal haplogroup came back as A-V5A80, a sub-haplogroup of A-M13 or A1B1B2B a rare lineage mainly found today in eastern Africa at a frequency of about 40%, but is also found at much lower frequencies in some parts of the Near East and some islands in the Mediterranean. Taking all these studies together, we see sublineages of Y chromosomal haplogroups J2A, J2B, E1B1B, T1A, R1B, and A, and we find sublineages of mitochondrial haplogroups HV, H, I, K1A, N1B, T2B, T2C, U1A, and U7. The majority of these haplogroups originated somewhere in Eurasia, but their distributions are not the same. We also have an African origin for Y chromosomal haplogroup A, and E also originated there, but the specific E1B1B lineage is associated with out-of-Africa migrations, and it's found today mainly in North Africa, the Balkan Peninsula, and the Near East, with a presence in Europe and parts of East Africa as well. It's really interesting when we compare the nuclear genomes to haplogroup estimations, in particular for the man from the Casa del Fabro, because they show just how important it is to analyze the nuclear genome when we want to study genetic ancestry. All haplogroups have a place of origin, and they are found to varying frequencies in different places today. However, I want to stress that haplogroups are not ethnicity-specific. For example, the Y chromosomal R1B lineage is most prevalent today in Western Europe, but it did not originate there and it is found in other regions as well. Sometimes, where your haplogroup is most predominantly found aligns nicely with your autosomal ancestry. However, it doesn't always fit this nicely, so it's important to look at the nuclear genome because haplogroups are markers of ancient ancestry. By the time you inherit a mitochondrial or Y chromosomal DNA sequence, it's possible that none of your autosomal DNA matches that haplogroup's current distribution or place of origin. In the case of the Casa de Fabro man's haplogroups, one might assume that he was part sub-Saharan African if we went with the place of origin and modern frequency of the haplogroup A. However, when we look at his nuclear DNA, this wasn't the case. Another thing that DNA is useful for is finding out a skeleton's gender. Usually, a bioarchaeologist can do this just by looking at the bones, but this all depends on the quality of preservation, and the bioarchaeologist must also have a good understanding of morphological variation between populations. It is often quite difficult to assign gender based on the incomplete bones left in the Pompeian plaster casts, so DNA is extremely valuable in a case like this. In the House of the Golden Bracelet, two adults and a young child were found together at the foot of the staircase within the house and the child appears to have been standing on the hip of one of the adults. It has long been thought that this was a mother and her child, especially since the adult was wearing an intricate golden bracelet, and the other adult nearby was thought to be the child's father. However, DNA showed that all of these individuals were male, so nobody could have been his mother. And this wasn't the only thing that DNA showed. It also showed that none of the adults were biologically related to the child. 
at least up to the third degree. Ancient DNA is a bit limited in terms of how far back we can estimate genetic relatedness. It's not like taking a DNA test today and finding out you have hundreds of fourth cousins. That said, we can rule out the possibility of the victims of the House of the Golden Bracelet having been a genetically related family. This finding is very interesting, and it certainly tells us that our interpretations shouldn't be based on assumptions. In this case, the individuals found in the House of the Golden Bracelet were not a mother, a father, and their children, as has been commonly thought. This is a very useful application of ancient DNA studies in Pompeii because we can learn more about the final moments of the Pompeian victims, find out who they may have spent their final moments with. We may not know exactly what the relationship between the males in the House of the Golden Bracelet were, but at least we know they weren't a genetic family. So we can devise some new hypotheses. The same goes for the two Pompeians in the House of the Cryptoporticus, who died in what appears to have been some form of an embrace. It's been assumed that these were either sisters, a mother and her daughter, or lovers. One of the individuals came back as male, and the other didn't have good enough DNA to find out what the gender was. So even though we still may not know what the relationship between these two people exactly was, we can at least rule out the first two interpretations. But here is where I disagree. That the finding of a bracelet on one of the males challenges our ideas of gender in the past because bracelets were supposed to have been worn only by Roman females. The paper officially states, I quote, that these discoveries challenge long-standing interpretations, such as associating jewelry with femininity, end quote. The truth is, there are many interpretations we can draw for this phenomenon based on the context. The thing is, Pompeii is a unique case study. It was destroyed by a volcanic eruption, and the people we find there were either in a process of evacuation or awaiting their ill fate because they knew they couldn't make it out on time. When drawing interpretations, we need to consider context. In the specific case of the House of the Golden Bracelet, it looks like the people within this house were trying to evacuate. Could it be possible that this man had chosen to take a valuable object in his house as he tried to escape, and that this was not an object that he would have worn on a daily basis? Is it possible that the bracelet had a sentimental value for him? Maybe it was his mother's, his sister's, or his wife's, perhaps someone who was no longer with him, and that he didn't want to leave it behind because of that sentimental value. It really is important to place our interpretations within their appropriate contexts. According to the paper, the males in the House of the Golden Bracelet were seeking refuge under the stairwell in an attempt to flee their house for the city's port. With this context in mind, I wouldn't automatically conclude that this bracelet challenges our ideas of femininity and Roman gender norms. There are many reasons why we'd find a golden bracelet on a man who's trying to escape, knowing he'll likely never see his house in town ever again. That's it for this episode. It's no understatement that ancient DNA has enriched our understanding of the Pompeians, their genetic history, and who these victims were beneath their plaster casts. We now know the genetic origins of a handful of Pompeians, and we can establish whether there were any genetic relationships between victims found closer together. And as more of this work gets done, we will develop a better understanding of the final moments of the victims of the Mount Vesuvius eruption. Don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe for more cool content by your go-to informant on everything archaeology, Madam Archaeologist.